Hoy en la Taberna de Rol vamos a hablar con Gareth Hanrahan. Él es un autor de fantasía y también diseñador de juegos de rol. Muy recientemente diseñó el suplemento de Moria para el Anillo Único, pero también trabajó en otros varios juegos, muchos de ellos con propiedades intelectuales, con franquicias enormes. Vamos a preguntar un poco cómo es su proceso creativo, cómo es trabajar cuando hay que mantener un canon, ¿no? un lore de juego tan complicado como puede ser el de Tolkien en el Señor de los Anillos y también de eh, todo lo que se viene que él está escribiendo y en lo que está participando. Así que quédate ahí y mira esta entrevista. Gareth, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you are known both as a novelist and a TTRPG uh, writer. So before we get to that point, let's take a step back and talk about your beginnings, which is always a question that is asked in any interview, right? We've seen some interviews you had before. You you mentioned, uh, for example, that uh, your mother introduced you to Tolkien uh, at yeah. a young age. Uh, would you mind sharing with us uh, uh, how this happened and how it influenced uh, your your creativity, your writing, your your job, even as a well, DTI designer? Um, yeah, I mean, my mother had read Tolkien herself. As, as it, when she was young, um, it somehow became a sort of family tradition to read it. I remember my, being told that my uncle, uh, when he was reading as a child, was going like, you know, is Gandalf really dead? When uh, Gandalf falls in. Um, so I read Lord of the Rings when I was eight or so. And then um, there was a Tolkien week in the local library, and all these people to sit around a table with little miniatures and I, I now know where character sheets, but back then I had no idea what it was. So I went over like, you know, what's this? And I said, here, have a go. And they gave me a character sheet, which started with the line, you are an elf who has passed through Moria. I went, I don't know what this is, but it's clearly the best thing ever. And it took me about a year to work out what it actually played because this was before the internet and before he could just like Google what a role playing game is. So I ended up buying this incredibly complicated Iron Crown Prisons war game, which like hex maps and everything. And it spent a year trying to work out, okay, they hit character sheets and this is all little dice. So I'm not sure. But it's the same box, so it must be the same game. Then finally found Dungeons and Dragons, played D D and other role-playing games. Um, went to college, was involved in the gaming society there, did scenarios. Scenarios led to doing some freelance work. Freelancing work led to full-time jobs. Full-time job led to, well, here. <laughs> so yeah, basically my mother gave me a couple of the rings and doomed me for the rest of my life. So uh, you mentioned that, that your mother had read uh, Tolkien uh, before. Uh, was uh, fantasy literature uh, common in your in your family? Was something really present or was Tolkien the, the exception in that? I mean, was literature in general something you you were exposed to as a, as a mother speaking when you were young? Yeah, I mean, well, my um, mother, my, my, my grandmother was an English teacher. My mother was a history and French teacher. I can't remember her reading any other fantasy books. Um, Lord of the Rings seemed to be sort of the singular fantasy book she read. Um, although I was given lots and lots of history books, which are not too far away. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was sort of the, the, the one um, point of fiction which was sort of like passed down to me. Um, And then uh, from, the, from there I went on and like discovered many, many other fantasy novels. But that was the one thing she, we shared. That's great. So you you told us about how you encounter TTRPGs in your life. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, until that point, have you heard before about uh, role playing games? No, I never heard of it. This was back, this was back in 1990. Okay. Um, Yeah, we, so I, I, I had no idea that role-playing games existed. I'd never encountered them. And again, it took me a year to, to actually work out what I'd actually played. And another, like, you know, a few months to actually get a group together and infect my friends. <laughs> But that, that, that was the fascinating time. Like, 
again, pre-internet, you you had you, you discovered things and like have no context to them. Like I remember finding the um, I, got, I got like the basic D and D books, and then I found a copy of um, Manual of the Plains for first edition in the same um, shop, and I remember leafing through going, okay. This spell isn't in the D and D book. Oh, I, I, like all I had was the name of these spells and trying to work out what they might do. It was wonderful sort of serendipity discoveries back then, where you get like I remember like finding book two of um, the Wheel of Time, and not being able to find book one at all. And going, okay, I would like to you know, work out what happened in book one from book two. So the, the relationship between literature and TTRPGs started right then. How old were you yeah. when this happened? Uh, I'd have been about 12. Oh. Who else? You here? Hello? Yes, yes. Go, go ahead. Okay. I, 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 the Widows got it. Got it? Are you still with us or is it. Uh, I think. I think we lost. <laughs> Uh-huh. Let's wait a second. Volvemos después de este corte comercial. There you go. There we go. Hello, hello. Sorry. There we go, there we go. No problem. No problem. So we let it out. That's that's the beauty yeah. of doing it <laughs> recorded. Exactly. So, yes. uh, you were telling us that you were what, 12 years old? Or? Uh, yeah. um, do you want to ask questions again? We'll skip back to that point. Thank you. Yes, if you want, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Wanted, I wanted to ask you, uh, how old were you when this relationship between literature and, and TTRPGs started? Uh, when you discovered games and started playing? Uh, yeah. How old were you? It was it feel about 12, because it was like the end of I'm not sure. Um, basically, in Ireland, you got primary school, which is, up, which is like up until about 12, and then secondary school. So it was just that's sort of the cusp of going to secondary school. So yeah, I've been in 1990, so I've been 12, and then um, from there on, it was gaming pretty much constantly for <laughs> many, 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 many years afterwards. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned in some other interviews that you started writing as a hobby while pursuing a, a real job in computing. <laughs> <laughs> what was that period of your life like? And and what what kind of things were you writing during that time? Well, um, I got very involved in the gaming society in the, in the university. Um, Warpcon, so we would go there every year. And we had a sort of a slightly odd system where uh, at the convention, basically one person would write say, the Cthulhu scenario or the D&D scenario. And then you'd have a bunch of tables all playing the same game, with like different GMs running it. It was, it, we somehow inherited from the old RPGA tournament system, which we played everything. But the advantage of that was you got sort of good at writing games that people could run. Like you, you wouldn't just write the scenario notes for yourself, you'd write up like, you know, a 20 page scenario with like, you know, here's how to, here's how to run it. So basically, we were all writing sort of one-shot mini supplements, and um, I did a bunch of these for games like uh, Blue Planet and so forth, and other armies. I went, okay, I've got these. They've got pre-generated characters. They're basically really like relatively easy to run convention one-shots. I'll put them up online. People can download them, and that got me a freelance gig doing some adventures for Blue Planet for publication and then conveniently the D20 boom started and there was a sud suddenly a demand for freelancers so I started doing like, um, stuff for uh, any company that would hire like I was doing stuff for Alderac or White Wolf or many many different people um so yeah, I, I've always been good at sort of like I can write in many, many different styles and different games. Um, so I was able to turn my hand to lots of things. So during this this time, uh, did the idea did the idea of making it in the TTRPG industry ever cross your mind, or, or you just was doing it as a hobby? 
was just I'm just happy. I, I, I thought I was going to be sensible and like you know, get a real job in computer like I said. Um Yeah, no, but, uh, my uncle is a playwright. Uh so I'm sort of familiar with the somewhat precarious life of being a full-time creative and I went, no no, that seems really stupid, that's a silly thing to do. I get a, a real job doing computers and like you know, keep the writing off to one side. And then the real job of computers went away and it was very boring anyway. And I thought I would last a few months. Um but managed to keep going. I got a a full time job with Mongoose Publishing came up um soon enough that I was able to jump onto that. Uh but yeah, there was there was never any planning or sense to it. So let, let's talk about that turning point because you mentioned in in uh, some of the interviews we uh, we reviewed that moment when you lost your job at, at uh, computing your, your boring job as you mentioned yeah. just now and and that moment when you made the jump to the to the to the industry right to the hobby mm -hmm. um, and yeah. why did you how was that one that moment how, why did you choose to make that a uh, jump to pursue writing even knowing the difficulties of of the creative endeavor and everything yeah uh, I mean, because the story I mean, could have been very different if you if you had yeah. chosen the safe choice right the safe <laughs> the boring choice yeah i mean i i, I was I, 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 again, I don't think I ever made a, a sort of decision to go, oh, I will do this. It was always sort of, I, I'll give it a go for a few weeks. Um, I, I assumed basically that I would take a month or two off and then go back looking for a job. Um, and so I was like, doing, I had a few bits of freelancing lined up. Then Bruce Bow got me a, like, a, a, a like, the third of a book doing stuff for the old 6th edition Gamma World D20, doing monsters for that. And like, so suddenly I uh, had like a chunk of cash from that, which covered rent for another month or two. And there I just kept picking up bits of freelancing. And uh, at every point it was like, you know, okay, you know, after this like assignment, I'll go back and get, get a real job. Um, you know, it, it, there was never any plan. It was always just like, you know, what am I doing this month? No. I'll, try, I'll do some more writing and uh, just sort of snowballed from there. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the turning point really was, was getting was uh, getting the, a full time gig with Mongoose because that kept me going for several years afterwards. And yeah, that was <laughs> an unexpected but very welcome change. <laughs> so something I I I think something that. That you you have mentioned uh, is the importance of writing consistently. We mm -hmm. we heard you yeah. saying, uh, and even if the initial work isn't great, because you can always <laughs> uh, polish that later. Have you Absolutely. always held this view, or is it something that was developed over time? Um, I think I've, I've always like you know. Uh, been very good at like you know sort of sitting down, doing the work. I, I I've I'm, I'm terrified of, of deadlines, so I, I try and get like I, I'm not the sort of person who like you know, does everything the night before. I was always a very good boy and did my homework well in advance. Um, and then Mongoose had very 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 a very very like you know intense schedule. They were, at that point, they were basically doing like a book a month, which was in retrospect insane. It was, it was 70,000 words a month was what, what it looked for. But that was a fantastic training period because you like it, it taught discipline and focus and like, you know, you would have to sit down and write your 3,000 words a day or whatever. Um, yeah. And while it was punishing, it was also a very, very good set of skills to develop at the start of my writing career. Um, well, was, was, was this time or, or have you... Have you worked this uh, before? Like getting yourself to write consistently. Like, was this the uh, the time where you uh, focused on this? Uh, with yeah, what I, you're telling us, no? 
Uh, I mean, I, I've always been. Um, I, 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 I always yeah. been quite, quite a mess. Like, I, I just like you know, either freelancing or scenarios or just like you know, my own campaign notes, which at that back then, then were voluminous. <laughs> um, but Mongoose very much sort of focused, focused my approach to writing because again, their, their deadlines were so punishing that like you know, if you didn't stay on top of the work. Um, you would like, rapidly fall behind, and I, I, I saw other writers for them uh, lose their jobs when they didn't meet the deadline. So much right, that, that won't happen to me. I mean, at that point, I also started playing World of Warcraft, which, in retrospect, very, very bad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I got just got into the habit of basically, like, okay, I need to write X thousand words per day to meet this deadline. I will, I, I will get out the spreadsheets and I will track how much I'm doing. I will not fall too far behind. I will build, build in a bit of a buffer. Um, and yeah, and at that point, or at this point, it's pretty much sort of second nature to me that I, I, I haven't seriously missed a deadline in some time. He said, <laughs> Invi hubristically inviting to. <laughs> So, uh, continuing with the with the with the writing, you you also said that you don't believe in writer's block, at least in the way that most people describe it. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with what most people call writer's block? Um, well, again, partly it's the whole precariousness of the full-time writer, where if you, if if you, if you get blocked, you're not going to get paid, and if you don't get paid, then you know. Bad <laughs> things happen. Um, the great thing about role playing games, though, is well, there are some great things about them. But among the many great things about them, number one, it's very varied work. Like you know, if you're doing a novel or something, you get stuck on a particular scene or a part of the storyline, then that is basically the entirety of the novel. Like you, know, it, like you, know, you, the characters need to move past, past that point. You need to like get that plot working. If you're stuck, it's you're, back, you're, you're screwed. In a role-playing game, if you're doing like you know, a supplement with ten chapters in it and you're stuck on one chapter, you've got another nine which you can work on, and they're because they're not dependent on or they're, they're not like you know, as utterly dependent on that chapter. Like you, you you can write like you know, if I'm doing say a like a, a supplement on. Um, I'm blank on all concepts, but there are on dragons. Then, if, if for some reason I am stuck on dragon layers, I can go off and write about dragon treasure hordes, or dragons at war, or dragon spells. I can, like, you know, there'll be something else to work on. And the other thing about role-playing games is because they're functional, they have to, like, do something at the table. You have to give useful information to the GM. Even if you feel your prose is stodgy, or dull, or just terrible, and you hate yourself, you can at least go, okay, this is terrible stuff, but at least I know I can I can write you know, write something a GM can use at the table and they can, they will be able to make it good even if what I'm giving them is kind of terrible. And then you can go back and polish it later on. But it's just you can always find something to do and work out a role-playing supplement. Whereas with other fiction it can be trickier. Um I mean writer's block I think is half lack of confidence. And half lack of knowledge of what you're doing. And role playing games, you know what you're doing because it has to be useful, and the confidence you, you just fake until you have text on the, t on the page. So um, let's talk about another subject that uh, mm -hmm. makes the, the adrenaline pump, right? <laughs> that is uh, working on projects that belong to some franchise, some intellectual property, right? Like uh, you've worked in many of them, most recently the One Ring, for example, or Babylon 5, Gone, and etc. What uh, what challenges does a TTRPG writer face specifically when working on something that has established lore? I mean, for example, how how do you stay creative when you have mm -hmm. to to also stay true true to a uh, source material? Yeah. Um. It depends all on the source material. I mean, the first thing to do is you have to find something you love about it, no matter what it is. You have to basically work out what the appeal of that property is, both for its existing fans 
and for you and they have, they have to be exactly the same so for example with um say lord of the rings you have to you have to, like you really embrace the language the history the sense of place of it's like it's being tolkien it's catholicism it's sense of grandeur and age and melancholy um with other properties they each have their own uh things that appeal to the existing fans and they have to like find the, the things that like, you you really enjoy in them and then it's just a question of mastering the honestly, honestly absorbing all the lore like you know like there will always be fans who know stuff better than you but you need to basically get the basics right and know where like you know where to do the research what, what to drill into what sources to consult um you have to do, do your homework and then again to go back to like the idea of like role playing games being useful at the table you have to keep in mind like you know that you're writing a game supplement it has to be useful you have to, like you know, the adventure has to involve the player characters it has to be logical progression it has to basically be flexible enough for the gm to um to run it but also really emphasize the selling point of that particular ip so if you're doing a talk to us adventure has to be like you know epic has some high adventure it has to basically emulate stuff in the rings if you're doing about one five it has to have the right like the has to show off the various aliens it has to be has to politics has to have like you know illusions the first ones if you're doing a conan thing it has to be bloody and action filled and feel like conan if you're doing like this a star trek has to be like a moral dilemma of some sort it has to be like exploration has to basically be a little bit cozy. Um, so you, you're trying to basically balance the unique appeal of the IP and the book side of the role playing game. Uh, and also, like, you know, get, get all the facts right. Um, the other challenge, of course, is dealing with licensors, and there it depends very much on who they are and what the limits of the license are. Because, like, like, Lord of the Rings has its own particular set of things you, you can and can't touch and can sort of. Be, be, you can hint at stuff that isn't the license, but not the rest directly. Whereas in Babylon 5, it gets trickier because they're the person who, who invented it is still around, and you have to, like, you know, be careful what, what you can invent and, like, you know, when to, when to invent new stuff, when to go off and ask for guidance. Um, and also, you've got the risk of, like, you know, more, like, you know, role play games tend to be the, like, you know, lowest tier of licensing. Like, you know, no one really cares about role playing games. So, if like you know, a new TV series about Run Five has been got made, that would could potentially run roughshod over what we do for the game. We're gonna like you know, practically ca- running catch up. So, uh, I'm gonna to I'm going to talk to some other spooky thing about writing. <laughs> <laughs> Many <laughs> writers experience imposter syndrome, and you are not only writing original work but also as we just just uh, speak uh, <laughs> you work by uh, contributing contributing to massive franchises and and with b- passionate fan bases you yeah. you 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 just told us a, a little about that in one interview you mentioned checking the reviews of moria anxiously mm-hmm. ha- how do you handle criticism and and manage that possible imposter syndrome in, in your career with with all of this that that you told us? Yeah. Um, do I manage it? Do I manage it poorly? I mean, um, I think, and this sort of goes back to what we were saying earlier about discipline. Like you, you, you have to. If you know that you have to write two thousand words the next day, then you go and do that, even if you're terrified, even if you're feeling depressed about reviews. Like the the, the work is still going to be there if you if you if you're willing to do it. So, I mean, I, I, people say like, oh, don't read your reviews, like you. Be careful in engaging with like you know fan responses and so forth. 
uh, which is very good advice, which is advice I never actually take because I always, always read the reviews and I <laughs> always engage with fan stuff. But yeah, I mean, if you let yourself, if you, it, it, it's like the, the cartoon where the characters like you're know, running along. If, if they look down and they'll see the pit beneath them, they'll fall. You like you, you can glance down the corner and go, oh, like you know, I'm not sure about this. That was a bad review. Will people like this? But you just keep charging on. Um, you 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 have to delude delude yourself and sort of sort of split split your mind so you can go you go okay I'm, I'm aware that I can't that there's a lot of criticism of this or that this is a very very high profile project and it could all go horribly wrong. But you just keep charging ahead, going okay I'll write the next section of this. Um, the other thing that's really re- reassuring is that there's this almost alchemical transformation between text in a word document and text in a printed page and if you're like you know you, you, I, I write a document and i go oh, this is kind of okay and then you get the actual like you get the actual book for example and like stuff that like you know was just like you know 12 point times roman text suddenly on nice paper and there's lovely art around it nicely laid out and it reads so much better so you, you sort of like, at this point, I sort of trust myself going like, okay, it's, it's only okay on the page in country, but I know that when it's actually printed, it'll just be somehow better writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like this because I, I wanted to ask about the, uh, like, like how your experience as a DDRPG writer influenced your work as a novelist. Uh, you also mm-hmm. mentioned that you you knew how to jump for the um, writer's block in 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 the DRPG writing and how mm-hmm. how to affect the the novelist writing. So how how in, in what other points does the skill from one thing uh, enhance the other one? I mean, what I've always found is that like all the skills of plotting and world building and sort of scenario design transfer most of the way into novels but the thing, the thing that keeps tripping me up is that novels don't declare characters like you know with XQPG you're creating it as a, as a writer you're not only creating it in insertion with the players you have games master in there like you know I'll provide some text the games master will interpret that their players will provide input it'll all be the sort of rich like interact interactions and various elements. Whereas the novel, it's just the writer. Like the reader is there, but the reader is like you know pretty much passive. They're not like you know giving anything back. So it took me a long time to work out how to to drive my own novels, so to speak, and like, you know, or write write my own narratives, which became novels, and not rely on that whole interplay between. GM and players. Um, so yeah, the, no, novels have been. I found. I, I, it's, it's weird. I, I, I've talked to like novelists who've done some um, tabletop stuff. They've gone, "Oh, tabletop is much harder to write because you've got like you know, you, you kind of like, think of like different options and like there are like all the different ways the story can go." Whereas novels, set in one way. Whereas I find novels much harder to write because if you. With tabletops, you've got all these different ways you can go. You don't, you don't have to pick any of them, but novels you have to pick like you know the one definite story. This w- this will happen as opposed to these ten things might happen. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that was an answer, but <laughs> I wave my hands a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to to ask you something. It's a, a bit of a of a follow up question to, to something you you said. We talk about um this interplay between novelist and did you appreciate writer did you appreciate writer and novelist you mentioned it in a lot of in a lot of other interviews and, and sometimes when when someone is interviewed a lot and um, we we watch a, a couple <laughs> of your interviews i know that this can get a little bit stale. so i wanted to ask you if if there is any medium or any genre of or any um 
other part of writing that that you are interested in perhaps in exploring that you haven't yet for example uh, one might uh, mention screenwriting or uh, writing for video games or that sort of things is that something you have in mind even if you are not are not working at the moment i mean i i've done some video game stuff um and i'm still doing doing more of it i i i I do find that quite frustrating because in a role-playing game or a novel, you can go, like, you know, the player characters walk up a mountain and there's a castle there. And, you know, just by saying there's a castle, no, there's a castle in the story or the GM can describe a castle. In computer games, you know, there's a castle there. And they go, okay, we've now got to build the castle. You know, and, like, you know, have, like, you know, modelers, like, design it and, like, you know, people like, you know, graphics artists design it. Or what happens more often is they'll go, no, we can't have a castle. We, we, don't, we don't have the budget for a castle. You can have, like, you know, we did this hut earlier. You can have a hut. Or, <laughs> you know, we can't do huts. You can have ten wolves. <laughs> um, and because text is the cheapest thing in a computer game, you tend to be at the bottom of the pile. So basically, whenever, like, things, ha- things need to get changed, they'll go, okay, like, the writers will sort it out. Um, in terms of other things, as I said, my uncle is a, a playwright, um, and there's a lot of crossover, I suspect, between like, improv- the improvised drama of tabletop games and the like, you know, real drama of the stage. So, at some point, it could be fun to do something like that, but that's like, you know, perilously close to real art, which I've stayed away from. <laughs> uh, what else? I listen, to, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I should, I should try, try to explain podcasting at some point. <laughs> Everyone else seems to be doing it. <laughs> so, uh, in many of your projects, there's a significant historical influence, such mm-hmm. as the Dracula dossier for Knights Black Agents and the Borelus connection for Delta Green. You've even mentioned uh, drawing inspiration from Cold War Berlin for your city mm-hmm. in one of your novels. How do you approach incorporating uh, history into your work? How, how how do you start with the historical with the historical event itself, or do you seek out historical parallels to fit your narrative? Um, basically, I, I just read an awful lot of sort of pop history books. Um, like I, I just like wander into a bookstore, grab like you know, move, move the camera over. <laughs> like it, that that whole bookshelf is all just random history books, and you get it. And like you know, I, 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 there'll be no real structure to it. Just like you know, oh that like you know, this book about like you know the zoo in the Tower of London looks interesting, or this one about the history of postal services. I just. I just grab them and like, stick, like read them, stick them on a shelf, and then, like months or years later, I go, "Oh, hang on, that's a, that's I could potentially use that." I mean, you, you've clearly listened to lots of my other interviews, so I will bore you by repeating my anecdotal <laughs> creativity. <laughs> Whereas my theory is that, like most, like, like creativity is basically bouncing two ideas off each other. So basically. If I have this, like you know, library of random historical bits, maybe one idea, and then I was like, you know, take some fantasy thing and bang them off that. So I might go you know, grab a random book. So we've got Paris between the Empires, 1814 to 1852, which I haven't read. I think I may have inherited this from my mother. Um. So I, I think you know, read to this. Um, that one, that's e commie, isn't it? Uh, 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 anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, but like, I've got this idea um, for a novel actually, which is set in a sort of quasi magical version of Paris. And uh, if I was like, if I, if I were doing a novel, I would like read to this book, read to other books of Paris. And then 
uh, the uh, novel is that there are these characters who can basically enter dreams and, and, and like, you know, spy on people that way. And so like spies. And I would basically take the idea of dream spies and all my powers research and bang them off each other until something sparks. So yeah, there's no like, you know, like, yeah, I, I wouldn't start with history necessarily, but I would just have, I would just like arsenal of bits of history I vaguely know. And then uh, when I find some like a genre idea I want to deal with, I would like, you know, go back to that arsenal history books and go, okay, which of these might fit and bounce them around until something works. So let's, uh, I, I wanted to, to delve into the subject before we, we change radically mm -hmm. about what we were talking. Uh, let's let's delve a little bit in the depths of Moria, one of the, okay. the, the latest uh, books you've, uh, you've uh, written for TTRPGs. How was the process uh, like for, for that book? Because you also mentioned that you always wanted to write this, but what we didn't know, and, and you mentioned it uh, when when we started this interview, <laughs> is that you even played a character that, that passed through Moria in that first game yeah. you, you had. So how, how was the process? How, how did it start? When did the, the idea, uh, when, when did it, uh, when was it first proposed? Sorry, and and what was what was through it? How, how did that work? Well, as I said, like my very, 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 very first roleplay character was an elf who gone through Moria. So it, it, you could argue I've been preparing for this since 1990. Um, more prosaically, I mean, I, I think once you have Lord of the Rings license, you're going to do a Moria book. Moria is just so iconic, so fundamental to the, not just Lord of the Rings, but to the entire TTRPG genre. I mean, it's like, you know, the first dungeon. That you're, like, you're kind of going to do a, Mor a Moria supplement at some point in the line, just because they were expected to do it. Um, the, then for the first edition of the, of the One Ring, in uh, 2007, um, I actually wrote a Moria adventure for that, which was going to be a sort of follow-on to Darkly Mirkwood. And that was basically, we were going to be playing specifically Balan's expedition. So basically, you, the first chapter was basically set up the expedition, traveling down through um, Wilderland, you get to Moria, and then the next five chapters are basically one per year of the adventures of the expedition as they're going through Moria and expanding the colony and then orcs come up and it all goes horribly wrong and you, the plan was that to give a blank Book of Marzable handout to the players to write their own history of, of the uh, of their colony and then Cubicle 7 uh, the license moved away from them there was second edition and second edition took a different approach to adventures and also the text I, I, I uh, belonged to C7, so I had to start again from scratch. Because I'd already done all the research, and they said, okay, you can, you can basically do it again. Um, and this time the design goal was to make something a bit more flexible, so instead of, you have to play Balan's Expedition, that would be just one of the many options to do it as a one-shot, do it as a... As a a, a, a long adventure in a campaign, do it as a full campaign. Not you didn't have to be dwarves; you could be other people going in there. So that was designed briefly, basically a more flexible approach to Maria. And then, in terms of actually like designing and writing it, a lot of it was just like you know the again what's usable at the table or what you to use at the table. Like some books, you need to sort of sit down and go, okay, how will this work? What should, what should go in there? But Moria, it just really came together. It's like, okay, we know we want a bunch of locations in there because people want background on, uh, on, on what's there. They want to be, to be able to visit the iconic locations. I want some like new stuff for them to discover. We know we need some, some monsters to fight in there. We know we need Balrog stats. We know we'll need underground exploration rules. We know we can't detail the whole place, so we need some sort of random tables for generating locations. 
we know we'll need some NPCs to guide them in there and some plot hooks. Uh, okay, that's 200 pages, that's like the book. It was never really any debate about what was going in there, just sort of like, you know, all came together very, very naturally, which was always, always nice, because like, you know, there are some books where you're spending ages trying to work out how it'll all fit together, and some books just, it's, it's kind of obvious, and Maria was one of the kind of obvious books. So then after that, it was just a question of working out what the various locations all were, were the, like the, both the ones that mentioned in the book and the, the, the new ones you want to add, um, where you have drafted the rules for Francesco to bless or rewrite, um, depending on his mood. And yeah, and just like, you know, delving deep into Tolkien lore and every possible mention of the war anywhere he's ever written. You mentioned something something interesting. You you, you talk about the uh, um, design goal, uh, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask you about the, the your design philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. If you compare your early work to to what you are doing now, what has changed and and what stayed consistent? Ooh, that's interesting. Um. I guess what's it consistent is that because I started out with one shot convention scenarios as my sort of the main thing I was writing, I've always been very, very focused on supporting the GM, on basically giving stuff that's useful immediately at the table. Uh, like feeling okay, here's like you know, here's something you could I, I hand you and five minutes later you, you can run the game. Um, but that isn't like, well, obviously, that's not possible with like Maria. There's still an emphasis on here is how to make it exciting for the players. Here is like, you know, here is stuff that you will be able to bring to the table fairly quickly. There, I, I, I'm not good at writing like the deep, obscure background that will never get used. I tend to really focus on what's useful immediately. Um, and similarly, like in, my, in terms of mechanics, I tend to take, I try and be simple. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a fantastic mechanic designer by any means. Um, in terms of what's changed, I think mainly that I've just had to learn that what I like in games isn't necessarily universal. And let's go back to what we talked about with, with um, Less Than IPs, but like in any game, if you're writing for game line, you need to work out what the fans love about it, even if that's not what you like. So, for example, with Traveller, which I was doing the last one, I had to make myself care about trade rules and ship design rules. Um, with. Um, Conan, for example, I had to like, you know, really, really care about combat maneuvers and that sort of thing. Um, I basically learned that basically each game has its own appeal and you need to basically identify what that appeal is and celebrate it. That you can't take one approach to all role playing games because if you do, you basically just like, you know, rehashing one game within another and won't, won't, it won't work there. Each game has to... Each game has, has its own unique traits. You need to be, you know what those traits are and embrace them. So I want to make a, a little follow-up question. You mentioned that one of the things you learned is that perhaps what other people like about games is not mm. necessarily what uh, you like, of course, no? <laughs> so. Uh, I wanted to ask you what what genre or what kind of of uh, TTRPG uh, style product etc comes more naturally to you. If you have to say, well, uh, what I personally really like, I mean, I can write about many things. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a writer; I can do it. But if I had to choose for my own games, what really feels at home, what is it? Um, I would tend to for either lighter, more humorous games, um, or what I have a terrible habit of doing is 
I can run a fantastic one shot with really intricate plots. But if it's a two shot, we're in trouble because I will forget all my very intricate plots in between sessions. So if a game's going to last four hours, I can spin a fantastic four hour session. If it's going to be eight hours, it's going to, it's going to slag a bit. I, I, I like you. I would just like you forget all the webs I've created because I, 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 I'm bad at writing stuff down in the middle of the game. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to be fairly improvisational when running a game. Um, so, like, you know, sort of light, not necessarily light hearted, but, but certainly fairly free spurgeon games. Um, yeah, I, I think that was what I that said, I, I, again, I, I've learned to appreciate all different styles of play. So I, 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 I will absolutely play, play almost anything. Um, like I, I would be equally happy doing a really, really old school dungeon crawl as playing some, like you know, very, very um, weird and light uh, indie game. And where do you see the TTRPG industry going in the next few years? Uh, do you see any trends? Well, what what would you say from from the inside of the industry? What what can we expect in general? I don't I don't know. I, I suspect I'm probably the wrong person to ask. Um, like as, I was at uh, Worldcon there, which is the World's Official Convention, and the two panels I went I sort of actively went to there were one on uh, like actual play and streaming and so forth and the other was, was on Lit, Lit RPG which is this are you familiar with this? Lit okay. RPG are basically novels set in games but that have game stats in them and this growing genre of like you know fantasy books but, uh, which I haven't really encountered before like I mean the biggest change in role playing games in the last couple of years has definitely been like you know Critical Role and all the like li live video play and so forth. I'm still haven't really got to grips with that. either how I feel about that or how best to use that. Um, so I, I mean, and if I'm playing catch up, then I, I'm not going to be able to answer that question very usefully. Um, the other big change recently seems to be I mean, it's a move towards solo play or move back to solo play. Um, which kind of took me by surprise. Like they did a solo play add-on for the One Ring, and I was like, "Oh, that, that, that that's huge!" Like you know, I'm sure some people will enjoy that. And that's become like you know, really big part of the game. And like people are clamoring for solo play add-ons for other games. So, and that, that's a real throwback. I can remember like you know reading books in the '80s, which were uh, which had like solo play elements in them. Um. Where, where, where things are going. I mean, there's also the question like, you know, the industry is is D and D and other stuff, and D and D seems to be off on its own very strange trajectory at the moment. And until we know where that ends up, it's hard to say because like most role players still find their way to gaming through D&D and if D&D is off doing this entirely online thing as it seems to be doing then I'm not sure where how that shakes out to smaller games like I, I would do so the answer is I don't know but that was a very long way to say I don't know <laughs> but you shared your your impressions and that's a lot yeah but uh, asking for some more impressions <laughs> What advice would you give to a new TTRPG designer who are just starting out now? Um, these oh, times, no? Yeah. Sorry, uh, are there any lessons from your own journey? Something that's particularly important uh, to hear now, nowadays? Oh! Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to answer. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> En el corte comercial. Hello, hello. 
Hello? Sorry, connection out again, sorry. Yeah, yes, it's okay. okay. If well, you don't want to answer, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, ask the question again so, so we can use the... Ah, yes. So, uh, following up, what advice would you give to a new TTRPG designer who's just starting out now? Uh, are there any lessons from your own journey that you think are particularly particularly important uh, for them to hear? Uh, I mean, uh, partly the answer is no, because it's been so long since I started out that like, everything has changed at least two or three times. Um, that said, I mean, in a weird way, how I started out what is now being formalized as the various um, community content things for like, you know, Hulu or the Free League games where basically you can go on to drive through and download their templates and do your own little, little sort of fan supplements. Um, and that's a good way just to sort of get experience with publishing and writing and the discipline of creating notes that other people can use because the big challenge of role-playing game writing is always just like you're producing usable material that basically you're you're not writing to entertain a reader you're writing a functional text that's supposed to be taken by a gm or players and used at the table and that's a particular set of skills like you, you can write very very flowery evocative text that doesn't actually help the gm um And if you want to write a story text, then go, go with a story. Um, I guess the other thing is just that like, yeah, things are so much more open now. Like when I started out, like self-publishing wasn't really a thing. It was just starting out there. I can remember being, uh, I, I, on the Forge in the very early days with one, one of the Edmondson people. Um, whereas these days it is much, much easier to be able to lay out your own game to, to distribute it electronically the challenge these days of course is, is just getting attention there's just like you know it, um it, there's so much stuff out there and people are so distracted and there's just so much content that getting noticed is the real challenge and i don't know how to do that um yeah so basically Go write your own stuff, and in terms of marketing and selling them, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks um, a lot. Oh, also, do, do, yeah, yeah, do, do, not, do not quit your day job. Wait, 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 wait for your day job to fire, to fire you, and then <laughs> start doing that. <laughs> that was my experience. I'm not sure I advise that, but it's, it's, it, it works for me, or seems to work for me. So, oh, oh we lost. Yes. I'm here. Ah. Oh, yes. I was here. Yeah. Go no. <laughs> my, head, my headphones fell out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Gareth, what can we expect from you in the months to come? Well, what comes next in your career? Um, next. Uh, next out is Dagger in the Heart for the Heart Roleplay game from Mono Deckard. Uh, that's a, another uh, campaign I wrote, which I wrote in parallel to Moria, which is really handy because I put all the weird ideas in that one. Um, Trade of Thulu 2nd Edition, which I'm doing with Ken Height, is kickstarting in early October. Um, that's a, a polish up and tidy and fairly light remaking of, of Trail, because Trail works perfectly as it is, and we're just basically making it a bit nicer. Um, and I have another novel out in next May. Um, that's The Sword Triumphant. And I think that's it, the stuff in the pipeline. Let me think. Yeah. I'm probably missing some Oh yeah, there's other stuff I can't talk about, but uh... all right. And then also, also there's the Paragon Blade, which is the gumshoe fantasy one-to-one -one game, which should be out, I hope, by Christmas. But don't quote me on that. 
<laughs> All right, perfect. So, uh, is there any uh, place we can follow you on social media? People that are watching the interview, or or where where can they hear the the news from what you're working on? on? Um, uh, gerhanrahan.com is my sort of my website, and that's sort of the usual um, sort of central point. Given Twitter, I, I, I used to be on Twitter a lot. Twitter is now less useful than it once was. <laughs> uh, I'm try on Blue Sky as well. Um, but yeah, garhanran.com is the, the, the go to place. And there's a newsletter there if you want semi monthly ramblings. Perfect. So, Gareth, thank you so much for being here for this interview. We learned a lot. Uh, it was really enlightening for us, at least. We, we delved into a lot of topics, <laughs> not only in through the minds of Moria. So, for my part, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Puel Leon, I don't know. Uh, thanks a lot. It's uh, no. It was a, a great chat. Uh, it was great chatting with you. <laughs> you, you, are, you, are, you are very fast uh, speaking, but I think we, we, could, uh, <laughs> we could fit a lot in this interview. Thanks to that. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank, sorry, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it, it's it's amazing for us in Argentina uh, to have the, the ability to chat with uh, people that actually are working in the industry. Since we don't have a lot of people uh, jumping that ship, um, we are we want to to push designers from here to the world. So it, it's great to to have your advice. Yeah, no, I mean. Um... Argentina, I've always been sort of fascinated by because I'm a huge fan of Borges. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what's the one Argentina that everyone goes to, but he's, he's pretty, pretty good. And he would totally have been a gamer if, he, if he'd been around, given his Lovecraftian fandom. Yes. Uh, 